This week in Tennessee, the state Senate passed SB 893 that requires public schools to teach what they're calling the, quote, controversy over evolution, global warming, and human cloning. The bill is pejoratively being referred to as the monkey bill, which is, of course, a callback to Tennessee's famous Scopes monkey trial in 1925 when a teacher was convicted for teaching evolution in the classroom. This bill says that teachers must find effective ways to present science curriculum as it addresses scientific controversies. As you can imagine, the Tennessee members of the National Academy of Sciences expressed their opposition to the bill and its companion bill in the House, HB 368, with a letter to the Tennessee House Education Committee. It reads, these bills encourage teachers to emphasize what are misdescribed as the scientific weaknesses of evolution, which in practice are likely to include scientifically unwarranted criticisms of evolution. As educators whose teaching involves and is based on evolution, we affirm that evolution is a central and crucial part of science education. Neglecting evolution is pedagogically irresponsible. Right now, I want to bring in Richard Dawkins, evolutionary biologist, professor at the University of Oxford. His latest book is called The Magic of Reality, How We Know What's Really True. And he was one of the speakers also at yesterday's Reason Rally in Washington. Mr. Dawkins, welcome. Thank you. Um, this seems uh, like a, you know, a kind of eternal recurrence problem, right? I mean, this this battle it doesn't seem to really necessarily uh, move in one direction. Or am I wrong? When I see Tennessee passing this law, I think there's an instinct to say we're just still refighting this. And actually, if you go back and look at Darwin, he was fighting it when, when Darwin first published, and we've been fighting it ever since. Has there been progress in the sort of social acceptance? I don't know about social acceptance. I mean, the, the, the fact is that there is no controversy about evolution. It's a fact. Uh, and all the reputable scientists in the world accept that. There is, of course, interesting controversy in science. And it's important that children should uh, be exposed to the fact that scientists don't always agree. Sometimes the evidence is not all in. So that's fair enough. But as for teaching the controversy over <laughs> evolution, what controversy? You might as well teach, in addition to the sex theory of where babies come from, the stork theory of where <laughs> babies come from. You could, if you like, you could teach uh, the creationist or so-called intelligent design theory. It would take all of about five minutes to give the evidence for it. There isn't any. And then you can get down to the true science. Right. But, but, but my, my, my question more has to do with the fact that, that, that we don't that, that these bills are uh, these bills keep surfacing, right? That, that we go through these kind of bouts in which there was obviously Scopes trial in 1925. I remember about what is five or six years ago there was a big Pennsylvania trial um, that was more or less along these lines. And so, uh, is, I guess my question is: Is there some percentage of the population that simply because of their faith tradition or the figures in authority that they trust, as opposed to the figures in authority that you or I or some of the viewers may trust, are just not going to? accept this? Is this sort of a battle that will never be won in your mind? Ever since the 1980s, uh, Gallup polls have shown that more than 40% of the American people believe that the world is less than 10,000 years old. Now that's an astonishing error. These people have the vote. These people are ignorant of science, and they are voting in politicians who are also ignorant of well, science. But lots of people but who yield power. Yeah, but lots of people who are ignorant about a lot of things have the vote. I mean, that is sort of the crucial well, principle quite. of democracy, right? <laughs> that's exactly right, and that's why we have representative democracy rather than having plebiscites like they do in some cantons See, of Switzerland. But when you have politicians who are apparently swaying to the wind of public opinion and who are legislating for truly ludicrous anti-scientific laws like this, then I think democracy is in trouble and we need to, to, to look at how to remedy this problem. I was very interested in hearing the earlier discussion and the, the suggestion that um, there might be too much religion in politics. In a funny kind of way, I wonder whether there's too little and whether there's a sort of taboo against challenging politicians with their religious beliefs. So, for example, if you have a presidential candidate, say, who says he's a Roman Catholic, challenge him publicly. Do you seriously believe that the wafer turns into the body of Christ? Do you really believe that the, the wine turns into the blood? Don't let him get away with that truly ridiculous I, beliefs uh, without challenging well, them. Uh, I, I, there's a lot of feelings about that, that approach. Um, I think that way lies ruin in, in civil war, basically. But, but Bob, um, I, I want you to respond to that right after we take this break. If your beliefs are as strong scientifically as you seem to believe they are, what's the problem with them being tested? You're going to decide on the mindset, the 
the training, the intelligence, and the future of this nation from your classroom, from what you and your colleagues deem necessary. And I find that totally anti-American. <sighs> As the uh, state rep, John DeBerry, defending this Tennessee law, which we were just referencing, which is sort of a teach the controversy law, we have Richard Dawkins of Via Satellite, who just, who just made, a, I think, an extremely provocative point that a lot of people on the panel had strong feelings about, which is basically that, that in, in the public realm, if religion is invoked in the public realm, um, then we should uh, subject public figures who invoke it to skepticism and debate on the articles of doctrinal faith, for instance, the miracle of transubstantiation that constitutes uh, the communion ritual in the Catholic Church, the church in which I was raised, the church in which my father was a Jesuit seminarian for seven years. Uh, 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 but that to me, I'll just say from my own part of it, that seems like a recipe for the worst kind of debate because everybody's private beliefs in this sphere are completely preposterous to outsiders and what you end up with is a whole variety of cross-channel uh, antagonism and hostility. Bob, you seem like you wanted to respond as well. Yeah, well, I think on the one hand, it's fine uh, when people invoke religious belief to defend their views on public policy to point out to them that they can't expect that argument to have traction with a larger world beyond their faith. That's fine. If you mean confronting them in that sense, fine. But when you go around, you know, challenging their theological beliefs, and actually, I know Richard goes further. I mean, USA Today quoted him as saying, I think, at this rally, maybe that people should show, quote, ridicule and contempt for religion and I just think that undermines the goals that Richard and I share. I think we both w would like for fundamentalists in Tennessee not to inflict religion on the science curriculum and the question is how to keep them uh, from doing it and I think there's a lot of evidence that what, what makes fundamentalists more fundamentalists and more inclined to do that is a sense of threat. And siege. when you have a sense of siege, and when you have arguably the world's leading Darwinian, Richard Dawkins, uh, saying, associating Darwinism with the idea that we should show contempt for religion, I just think that's counterproductive. Uh, uh, Richard, would you like to respond as the world's leading Darwinian? I'm not the world's leading Darwinian. <laughs> I'm not accepting that. Um, I think that um, we're making too much of a deal of private beliefs versus, versus public beliefs. You challenge a, a candidate about his beliefs on taxation, about military policy and so on. Why don't you challenge his beliefs about what he thinks about the universe and the world? If I'm a voter... You don't think those are I, distinct? As, as, you don't think that there's a distinction between private belief and public beliefs in exactly that sense, what the tax rate should be well, and I, how... I, I, I know that's the conventional view, right, and I right. fight this battle a lot. Um, but I, I do think that as a, as a voter, if I know that the person I'm contemplating voting for, however good his beliefs on taxation and so on may be, if I know that he privately believes that a 19th century man called Joseph Smith dug up some golden tablets, read them with the age of a stone in a top hat, and translated them out of some ancient language into not 19th century English, but 16th century English, that man was a fraud and a charlatan, and any modern politician who nails his colors to the mast of of that particular religion is somebody that I'm suspicious of voting for. I know those beliefs are private, but they're crazy beliefs. And why should I vote for a man, however sensible his public beliefs may be, if his private beliefs are ridiculous and mad? Well, I, uh, Susan, you've seen the other response. Yeah, it's, it, there, I think that there is enough to question people about in terms of the relationship between their religious beliefs and public policy rather than getting into transubstantiation. But I do want to make the, the point I, I mentioned earlier, which is people who are, I would say, below the age of 40 don't understand that the kind of religion talk we're having in presidential campaigns is really quite new. Nobody, Dwight Eisenhower, who I don't know what his private religious beliefs were, he was considered to be religious. Dwight Eisenhower and Abraham Lincoln did not go around talking about how their private religious beliefs or non-beliefs applied to the issues of the day. And one of the, it's very important for people to realize that this constant bringing of religion into political campaigns is really a product of the last 30 years. Uh, the first time it was ever raised, and properly so, was when Kennedy ran in 1960. But all he said then was, uh, Church and state right. separate. The, the Rick speech, the speech that famously up. made uh, Rick Santorum throw up. Jamila and, and Stephen, I want to get your take on this right after we take one, a quick break. 
All right. Uh, uh, the, how we talk about people's beliefs, I think, is sort of where we've been right now, particularly how we talk about people's religious beliefs in the public sphere and the degree of scrutiny we should um, subject them to, and specifically whether we should respect a distinction between sort of beliefs on public matters and public policy and private beliefs, whether those are you know doctrinal in nature. I am, just so I'm clear, I'm strongly in the camp of just not talking about people's private beliefs, no matter how preposterous uh, they seem to us from the outside. Jim, uh, Richard Dawkins is arguing the opposite, and Jamila, you seem like you, you are on uh, Dr. Dawkins' side here. Uh, thank you, Dr. Dawkins, and I, I, I just want to say that first and foremost. Here's the thing. If, if a candidate for president believes that I am cursed with blackness because I was on the wrong side of a war with his God, right. if a candidate believes that women should be subject to their husband's will or their father's will and women should be submissive, I need to know that before I go to cast my ballot. Now, we, those are public issues, but those, we, but those lie on the public side those, of the public private those, divide much more no, than transubstantiation. No, no, yeah, those sure they, are, do. They, they do, but they are just as, they are just as strong to be deep held private beliefs. I need to know what my candidates think and to give them a pass because you go, oh, that's a private thing, whether you believe you're actually eating the literal body and drinking the literal blood of your Christ. Well, here's the problem with giving them a pass. They legislate that way. There's no inclination to fix problems if you believe that, you're, that your God is going to come back in your lifetime and rapture all you good people up and leave us sinners behind to deal with the fallout from whatever but issue. For, well, but, okay, let me, uh, first of all, no one's legislating on transubstantiation, just, as, just to take no, okay, that particular okay. matter. I mean, it just on, is not the case that, there, that anyone's way. legislating on transubstantiation. But they're and legisla- there are a million... But they're legislating on, on you know, women... They're, they're turning my health into an issue. Yes, absolutely. And I think health into an issue of, I agree. Uh, and I think, you know, life begins at conception because the Pope says it does. I, I, and, and that if I, if, if I present myself to, in, right t- today in a hospital in Arizona and I am pregnant and the pregnancy will kill me if it continues and I go to a Catholic hospital, they have legislated that right. it's fine to let me die. That's a problem. And that's a privately held belief that legislators we have, publicly address. And I, and I think it's valid to point out to people who favor that policy that if they favor it on religious grounds, they can't expect the rest of us to buy into that because right. we don't share their religion. And I think that degree of argument is fine. I but think, we need to bring it up. We need to know about it. In that it. case, sure. I, and I think we are. I don't think, that's, I don't think there's, no, there's been a pass granted to anyone, particularly around the birth control debate. I mean, I think that, that's the area in which like, clearly we're having a public debate about precisely this, and it's precisely intersectional religion. The question of the, the, the degree of, of uh, you know, how much validity we want to ascribe to some specific doctrinal thing, I think is distinct. Hello from New York, I'm Chris Hayes. With me this morning, I have Harvard University professor Steven Pinker, who wrote The Better, Better Angels of Our Nature, Washington Post blogger Jamila Bay, Susan Jacoby, the author of Free Thinkers, Robert Wright from The Atlantic, an author of The Evolution of God, and joining us from Washington, Richard Dawkins, author of The God Delusion. Um, we, were, we were just engaged in, I think, a really interesting debate about the degree, where we sort of draw, draw lines between public and private belief, what we subject to scrutiny, how we go after other people's, whether they be public beliefs or private beliefs, specifically in the case of people's religious beliefs, and whether the privately held doctrinal beliefs that one might have should be subject to public uh, scrutiny or even ridicule, I think, as, as, as uh, Richard Dawkins suggested. And Stephen, uh, I was telling you during the break that you're very polite and you said you're Canadian, so that explains <laughs> it. Um, but but uh, you didn't get a chance to, to weigh in there, and I want to give you one. Well, it's interesting how the debate has changed. Uh, and it used to be that people debated whether evolution was, uh, should be allowed to be taught. Now it's whether the case for so, so-called scientific creationism should be added to the mix. Even there, the, what is supposed to be taught is not uh, biblical doctrine, but the ginned up so-called scientific evidence for, uh, right. for, for uh, creation. Likewise, the debate used to be on whether homosexuality should be criminalized. That debate isn't held anymore. Now it's about gay marriage. Whether contraception should be legal. That debate is over. It's been won. Now it's just on whether uh, Catholic organizations have to include it in their health insurance. For no copay. Issue- yeah, right. For issue after issue, the entire debate has shifted in a more uh, progressive, humanistic direction. We tend to lose sight of that because at any given moment we're talking about the issue of the day, of the morning, of the minute. But 
over short and long terms of, uh, uh, stretches of history, one can see the, uh, the, the progress that we've been made in an era in which, as you showed at the top of the show, secularism has been increasing, religious fundamentalist beliefs have been decreasing. One, one of the things I think is so interesting about this debate is the ways in which, in the context, particularly of global warming, which, I, which is, I think, the, the single most important issue we face and where the stakes of all of this are the highest, um, the, the very slippery way in which the liberal spirit of tolerance and open-mindedness is used to defend skepticism on the scientific consensus on global warming, right? So when you, when you, when you listen to people talk about, when you listen to people who are attacking the, the very robust scientific consensus on the warming planet, um, they, will, uh, they, they will say basically, well, we're just asking questions, right? We're, we're, we're engaging in the good skepticism um, that, that, that you say that you, that you hold to. Um, and then, of course, there's, there's a religious component to a lot of that, this disbelief as well. Here, Rick Santorum um, is talking about climate scientists in the Philadelphia Inquirer op-ed in February, and he says, climate change's Pharisees reassure us that global warming science is still settled. There's nothing to see here. Move along. Um, Bob, how do you deal with that argument about skepticism, which kind of uses a sort of open-mindedness of the liberal tradition in a sort of jujitsu move against itself? Well, it's actually a challenge because skepticism yeah. is a good thing, and you yeah. and you should always, up to a point, you know, question even what seems to be scientific consensus. In the case of evolution, I think we've gone well past the the point where you can reasonably question right. um, the fundamental premise. You know, climate science is tricky because the truth is most of us haven't had time to really delve in the details. I don't feel I but can. But that's launch. true about everything. Well, no evolution. <laughs> I really feel I know enough. I can I can right. argue right. because right. I've I, I've invested the time. Right. Um, I don't think I, I don't think those issues are comparable in the sense of being fundamentally uh, religious. I mean, first of all, I know a number of atheists who are actually climate science skeptics. Sure. A sure. and B. There's no inherent. Uh, contradiction between scripture and and and, and, and global warming, global the way warming. there is between a literal reading of Genesis and evolution. As, as it is unfolding in America, though, and I think here is is where I, I'm I'm shape shifting to Jamila's etch a sketching and and Richard, da <laughs> and, and Richard Dawkins shook up during the break. There is there is it. Climate change is being used as a religious issue because the the paragraph they're all using is the the verse from Genesis that gives man dominion over the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. Now, liberal religious people use that to say yes, and we have to do it wisely. We have a custodial Conser responsibility. Conservative religious people say we can do whatever we want with the earth, as Santorum himself has said, not for the sake of earth, but for the sake of us. So, if what we want we think is good for us is to strip the earth of all of its natural resources, well, that's our right, because we're such big, good, smart human beings. Stephen. Yeah, I think we always have face the uh, agonizing dilemma of what range of opinion uh, exactly. Can be yes, thank you don't you. want to have a show where you say, well, on the one side, denying the Holocaust, we have yes. so and so. Yes. Here. On the other hand, you do want want to be able to marshal quickly and clearly what the evidence is. If there is a Holocaust denier, you really should be able to come up with six indisputable right. facts that show the Holocaust really did take place. Right. And likewise, climate scientists do have the, uh, the onus of having a comprehensible uh, set of arguments why they believe that climate is changing. Likewise for evolution. A defender of evolution should have the evidence at his or her fingertips to persuade people to the extent that they can be persuaded. You have put your finger on l literally the driving thing that we think about every week when we put together the show, right? Which is what is the range of opinion, right? Where, where, do, you put the, where do you put the stake in the spectrum? And that's this, and, and when you, where you put the stake in the middle or where you put it determines a lot of what kind of conversation you have and how the conversation moves forward. Because, because ultimately you don't want to to just boil down to trust, that they're the priests on one side, they're the scientific priests on the other side. The difference is, that the reason that I do trust in scientists, right. even when I don't know every detail, is that every time I've had to check, they have had facts and arguments, right. they've earned that trust, they have to keep re-earning it by being able to put the arguments on the table. I'm a little bit of a defeatist about this because I really do think in the day-to-day -day world of lived experience of people as citizens, as voters, so much does come down to trust. It is about whose sources. When you say, when you say I haven't, you know, I, I haven't really dug into the climate science, or and when you say I can defend evolution, it's like, well, yeah, I can defend evolution in the way that someone who's like read the Richard Dawkins book <laughs> can defend revolution. But like, how can I defend evolution? I more or less paraphrase from the selfish gene, which Mr. Dawkins wrote. Like that's and and I more or less trust it because other people 
seem to trust it, and Richard Dawkins has all these credentials. And so, so no, but it has to go beyond that. That if you were to challenge Richard on any of, any of the facts, if you were to follow up on the footnotes of the selfish gene, right. you would find there really are peer-reviewed scientific right. papers with evidence that yeah. you can't deny. Rich, Richard, you you face this. I think you face this all the time, right? I mean, these arguments about skepticism and the way that 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 attempts to undermine evolution as a sort of bedrock foundational um, uh, fact about the way the world developed are, are often couched in this kind of um, liberal language of tolerance. What's your sort of response to that? Yes, I, I agree with what all the panel have said about that. Um, in, in, uh, I, for, for me, there is a distinction between uh, climate change, which I don't really feel qualified to, to speak about, and uh, evolution, where I where I really do. And, and I agree with Robert Wright about that. I agree with what Susan said. I agree with what uh, with what Stephen <laughs> said, um, and, but I, I, I also strongly agree with what Stephen said, that even those bits of science that we, we, we actually haven't read up ourselves, we trust because science has earned the trust. Uh, we know about peer review. Uh, we know that, um, that if a position has been argued in the scientific literature, it will be challenged, it will be tested, and so there is a sort of robustness about uh, scientific conclusions which science has earned, and and, and theology, which is a total non-subject, hasn't. In, in the case of climate change, by the way, it's not just genesis. It's also revelation. Uh -huh. um, we don't need to bother to ha have right. good stewardship of the world because Jesus is coming back, right. and soon. I mean, that's one of the dominant arguments that you'll hear from these nutcases. Mm -hmm. But just to underscore the challenge, I think Stephen and I both remember a time, we've written about evolutionary psychology, when there was what seemed to be a consensus, at least within psychology, that bringing in considerations of natural selection into the study of human nature was almost illegitimate. And I think we both agree. There was something like a consensus that we agree was basically um, wrong. So you do have to be skeptical even of consensus. Yeah. And in climate science, the reason I feel confident is because of opportunities I've had to interrogate Yes, exactly. People in the field, Same with not me. always even scientists, but right. people who just just know this stuff, and the public at large, I don't doesn't have that, that opportunity. opportunity. Right? I mean, they see two conflict. They don't know. You but know, that you can always trot out one scientist from some sure, college. Right. But this is the problem. This is the bedrock problem of, 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 of not just this issue. I mean, it's the bedrock problem that we face in sort of the project of self-governance and like keeping the civilizational project going, which is that, yeah, like, you know, someone works 12 hours a day. They get home. They have to deal with child care. They have to, you know, they don't, they, they don't, I, you know, I live this life where I go talk to a climate scientist and then I can interrogate them. Right. W the way that it cascades down is it cascades down through these trust relationships, right? And so those trust Trust relationships are forged. They're not forged on the basis of going back and forth to someone. They're forged on the basis of, of of affiliation, of identity relationship, of kinship, of of consonance of worldview, yeah. of, of the degree to which you feel this person is trustworthy. So when you someone who fits all those things says, "Do not listen to the climate scientists. They are trying to pull the wool over your eyes." The question of how you attack that authority from outside the sphere of it is is the most important one. And I want you to answer that, Susan Jacoby, after this break. That's something. We have spiraled up, upwards, as we always do on the show, into abstraction. But I want to ground it because it, no, because I, I really do. This is, this is something that I, I have a whole chapter in my book about, and something I, I think about a lot. It's like the process of public belief formation, because ultimately that's how we get our policies, right? I mean, and that process is a complicated one, and and how we move public opinion in a certain direction, social consensus, when it's not even just moral precepts, right? It's not normative questions, but it's just actually empirical questions that describe what is happening to the world. Is it getting warmer? Is it getting warmer because of the carbon that humans are releasing into the world? I want to show this graph. Um, it shows correlation between religious affiliation and the percentage of people believing in man-made global warming. I should say human-made global warming. Um, so total U.S. population, about 45% believe that the, uh, trust the scientific consensus or believe in the scientific consensus on global warming. People People who are unaffiliated religiously are much more likely to believe in that, the scientific consensus, up near 60%, and white evangelicals are far less likely to believe in it. And I think we've seen the way in which um, the, uh, the issue has been sort of transmuted into a culture war issue, fundamentally, where we're now in the place of 
of trust and authority and tribal signaling as opposed to a discussion of, of, of evidence. Right? Let's say also this is an educational <clears throat> issue, and nobody wants to say this because you get accused of saying that religious fundamentalists are stupid. And by the way, I want to point out that not all evangelicals are fundamentalists. There right. are educated yes. liberal evangelicals as well. But there is a direct correlation between... There are educated fundamentalists, funda I should say, yeah, actually. But there is a direct correlation between the prevalence of religious fundamentalists and lack of education. And this is probably what Santorum was talking about, too. You go to college, you get to be liberal. No. But you go to college, you presumably learn something about real science, real history. But, but, and know, so there is the fact to, is, to, is to, people to, with eighth grade and partial co college education, about 80 percent of them describe themselves as conservative religion. But I'll bet the graph we just saw is not entirely a, a product of, of an, uh, an education gap, per se. My guess is that the evangelicals, I'll bet because of large. social issues and so on, came to trust certain validators, the conservative That's right. validators. That's right. And now this issue arises, uh, and those validators are, are saying, no, glo global warming isn't happening. And, and I've got to think that's a big part of it. But the validators, you trust I, a question of education, too. I, I think there's a, <clears throat> excuse me, a perfect marriage between what the two of you are saying. It is absolutely an issue of education. Americans at large don't understand how to question appropriate. They, they hear something, they go, well, I trust the source that I'm, I'm listening to. And they don't, know, they don't know how to say, well, who funded that study? Right. Where did the money come from? Which uni did, did, were there any universities? What exactly does it mean to have a study that's peer reviewed? And what does it mean that this is someone who I've heard on a show with a host whose name I right. might or might not like? The fact that John Huntsman, when he was in the race, said, call me crazy, but I believe right. in evolution. I believe the scientists on global warming and people did. We featured, we featured that tweet a lot. But um, I, I, I want to push back on that just for one second, because again, this I disagree with what you're saying there. I don't mm -hmm. think, I'm, I consider myself a pretty educated person. In fact, mm -hmm. this is my professional full-time job is doing this. I'm very lucky that this is all I do is think about this stuff and I read peer-reviewed studies and things like that. And I, if I am honest with myself, I am still at a fundamental level relying on trust to a certain degree. Mm -hmm. And there's no way of getting around that and to pretend that, oh, what we, the enlightened cognoscenti do is so different from what they are doing who just trust authority, I think is really self-delusional. I think it, I, I really do. Stephen. Yes, but, but you do, you are skeptical about your trust in that right. you ask the question, who should I trust and why. And you have a reason for trusting some people rather than others. That You know that every time they are challenged, they can come up with the evidence and the arguments. And by the way, I think the politicization of these issues works both ways. I know a number of climate scientists who say that the worst thing that has ever happened in raising awareness of climate change is Al, Al Gore's Gore, movie. Yes, right. Because he, in effect, politicized it. Right. Not that anything, anything that he said in the documentary right. they had a problem with. Just because he is a figure that is associated obviously with a certain political party and ideology and so now it's, it's actually a reverse effect, right? Rather than yeah. saying who you trust, it's who you don't trust, right? Exactly. And I feel that way on issues all the time. I mean, I remember seeing Alan Greenspan testify on behalf, uh, in front of a Senate committee, and testify on behalf of immigration reform, liberalization of immigration reform, and being like, oh, maybe I'm wrong about immigration reform. <laughs> Alan Greenspan is saying so, it. So Al Gore can rev up the base, but at the same time, he is probably alienating the, the skeptics. R R Richard Dawkins, how do you how do you cross the sort of gulf of this this sort of trust gap? I mean, that that is the fundamental question, right? I mean, I think that's something that you're engaged in trying to do, uh, how do you do it? Well, I do agree it is a very, very difficult problem because nobody can read up all the scientific right. literature. Nobody, the, the best scientist in the world, can't keep up with science outside his or her own field. And so there really is a matter of trust. I keep agreeing with Steve when he says that, that, that science has earned the right to trust because you know that when people are challenged, in, in science, they can produce the evidence. They can say, look, here's Brown and McAllister, 2008, showing so-and-so. You can actually cite chapter and verse. That's what I worry about in the earlier question about teach the controversy. If you say teach the controversy in science classes, it implies that there really is a controversy, right. that there really is a kind of balance of scientific weight on both sides. And there aren't two sides in that particular case of evolution. Maybe in climate change there are, and I don't feel knowledgeable enough to be to be sure about that. But in evolution, well, I there do, and I don't think there are. are. <laughs> okay, I mean, right. I'm, but again, like I, I think that because of all the times that I've spent talking to climate scientists, you know, who, who uh, Bob. Yeah. Um, well, just, that, that sounds good to me. I mean, I, I you right. know, I, I, I get that. Right. 
Um, just to get back to an earlier uh, hobby horse of mine, and, and whether atheists should be confrontational, I do think if you want to inspire trust among evangelicals, and you're a climate scientist, right. I would avoid making fun of their religion. It's just elementary human psychology. <laughs> that seems like a pretty <laughs> strong to, piece well, of that, advice. This is my Mr. point, Wright. and I think it translates into the field I was talking about earlier, right. which is you know education policy. Right. Or anything, really. Um, Richard Dawkins is the executive director of the Richard Dawkins Foundation for Reason and Science and author of the book, The God Delusion, among others. Mr. Dawkins, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much indeed.